Welcome you again, and we are continuing through our series called Journey Through the Bible. We uh, have made it to the life of Christ now, and uh, there's so much that could be said, and we're not going to say a lot of it, not not now. Um, Lord willing, I'll preach through one of the Gospels, and we can go into a lot more detail, but at this time point... Um, just kind of discussing the overarching th- themes and tying the whole Bible together to kind of see exactly what Christ came to do. And so this morning we're going to talk about the new covenant, the new covenant. But before we begin, let's pray together one more time. Father, I thank you now for this time to hear from you. I pray, O oh God, that you would guard and keep my tongue from error. Pray that you would speak to us through your scripture, through your word. I pray that we would hear the divine voice this morning and be changed. I pray, oh God, that you would grant us minds to comprehend and understand how great a thing you have done in Jesus Christ. And I pray, oh God, that you would help us this morning to see him with eyes of faith, perhaps in a way we've never seen him before, and love him, God, with all that we all and all that we have. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And this morning, we are going to be talking about the new covenant. Um, and that, of course, is, is uh, contrasted with the old covenant. So... Um, Hopefully, this may sound a little theological this morning, but I pray that you can see exactly what God is doing here. I tried to make clear that in the old cov- in the in the Old Testament, which the word testament, by the way, means old covenant. So when we talk about the Old Testament, we are talking about the old covenant. God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. And he gave them these stipulations and these commands. It was the, it was the covenant. It was it was the it was the way that it was the privileges and responsibilities that the Jews had of being God's people, and the and the and what God had promised to be for them to be their God and to do for them as their as their covenant God. And it it entailed all the laws that they were supposed to keep, but also all the promises and the blessings that God would give to them if they remained faithful to the covenant, to the old covenant. So that's the old covenant. But, as we'll see, is there were some problems with the old covenant. And in fact, if you remember through our series through the book of Galatians, there, Paul, in the, New, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul explicitly argues that the Old Covenant was, in fact, temporary. It was good, but it was only for a certain season and for a certain purpose. And there are reasons for that, which we're going to discuss um, a little bit later. Uh, but now we're going to talk about the New Covenant. And so I invite you to stand now in honor of the reading of God's Word as we read from Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. Beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> it says, and, and when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. 
And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. The word of God may be seated. What I want to try to answer this morning is what is new about the new covenant? What is new about the new covenant? There are four things that I want to speak about this morning concerning the newness of the new covenant. Number one, in the new covenant, we receive new hearts. Number two, the new covenant creates a new people. Number three, the new covenant gives us a new way of living. And number four, the new covenant has a new mediator. A new mediator. So, four things that are new about the new covenant. New hearts, new people, a new way of living, and a new mediator. But first, number one, new hearts. New hearts. So... We've talked about it some, um, but just by way of reminder, as we discussed, the old covenant made that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai after he saved them from Egypt. The old covenant was good. The New Testament affirms the goodness of the new covenant. But I think what sometimes we misunderstand was that the covenant was given to a specific people at a specific time at a specific place. In redemptive history, it was given to the Jews at Mount Sinai, and it was the terms of their relationship with God and the terms of them maintaining possession of the land and receiving the fullness of the blessing of God. The old, the, the, covenant, the old covenant itself was, uh, was good uh, in and of itself. However, it was, it was good, but it was it's problematic for us. It was problematic for Israel because Israel had a... An intractable problem. Sin. Israel, were, they were sinners. They could not keep the covenant. They could not keep the terms of the covenant. They could not be faithful to God, therefore keep the terms of the covenant, and therefore secure all the blessings that God had promised them in the covenant. Because they could not keep it. You see, I believe, if we read the Bible carefully, that there is an inviolable inviolable principle through which God acts. And that is God only keeps his covenant and his promises through a faithful covenant keeper. So think about it. God made Adam and Eve and he told them to have dominion over the earth. There is an implied covenant there. You be faithful to me, Adam and Eve, and I'll give you the whole world to rule over and to reign over and to reflect my glory. But they rebelled. They were unfaithful to God. And so God cannot bless unfaithfulness. God cannot bless unbelief. God cannot pour out all the the blessings of his promises on sin. God requires a faithful covenant keeper to give the blessings of the covenant. And so the old covenant itself was good, but it was bad for us and for Israel particularly because they could not keep it. But we only learn later in the unfolding story of the Bible that the old covenant was never intended to be permanent, but that God had planned all along to do something greater, do something new, something not just for one nation, but something for the entire world. To bring them back to himself. And that's why I believe when we look at Jesus, you look at Jesus and you look at how the New Testament presents him in the Gospels. They're very intentional. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul calls Jesus the second Adam. Jesus is the head, if you will, of a new humanity. Adam was the head of an old humanity. A fallen humanity, a broken humanity. Jesus is the head of a new humanity, a restored humanity, a recreated humanity. And if you look at his life, it's clear that's what he came to do. For example, Jesus began his ministry by what? A 40 days in the wilderness. Why 40 days? Of course, it's it's quite obvious if we think about it. Because Israel wandered in the wilderness for what? For 40 years. And what did they do? They grumbled and complained and rebelled and disobeyed and disbelieved God. But Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness symbolizing that what? That he is taking on the responsibility of Israel on himself. 
He is representing the whole new nation of Israel in himself. And where Israel failed, he succeeded. And at the end of the 40 days, who comes to him? The devil comes to him. Who else had the devil come to them? Adam and Eve. And he tempted them. And you know what? The devil, one of the things devil tempted Jesus with? Forbidden food. Command this stone to be bread and eat it. But what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say to the lie of the devil? Man does not live by bread alone. But by what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So you see, Adam and Eve were confronted with the lies of the devil. And rather than going back to what God had said and saying, no devil, I'm going to trust God and not you. They believed the lie of the devil. But Jesus, when he was confronted with the devil, he goes back to what God had said and said, no devil, here's what God has spoken. I refuse to believe you. I will be faithful to my God. You see, Jesus succeeded where we failed. He, Jesus, fully God and fully... See, there's a reason he had to be fully God, but also fully man. He was, he's true humanity. He is completely 100% man so that he could be the perfect man, the substitutionary man, so that he could enter in into time and space and history just like every other man. And yet he would fulfill and satisfy God's demands, which we could not satisfy on our own. He comes in and he satisfies them in himself so that we who did it, who would it, who couldn't satisfy God's commands can join with him by faith, by turning from our sins and believing in Jesus who God has sent for us and surrendering our lives to him. The Bible says we join with him and therefore his life becomes our life. His death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. All the promises that that he won from God by being the faithful covenant partner, they are passed down to us, not because we earn them, but because he earned them for us. That's the wonder of Jesus Christ. God himself did this for us. He came down and satisfied the demands that we owe to him. But see, that's just, that's, that's, the, that's the crux of the story. But see, there's more to it as well. Because the, the point here is that we receive new hearts. And that is that Jesus, Jesus has secured for us what, what, what we could not secure for ourselves. You see, the problem with the Jews and the problem with us is our intractable problem of sin. We can't be faithful to God. So Jesus had to come in and and by his faithfulness secure the blessings and the promises of God for us. But if that was all that taken, if that was all that had happened, it wouldn't be enough because guess what? It would mean heaven would still be full of a bunch of sinners. It means we'd be forgiven of our sin, but we would never be changed from our sin. But you see, that's, that's why the new covenant comes in because Jesus comes not only to forgive us and to satisfy God's demands on our behalf, but the Bible teaches that now those who become in Jesus, who unite to him by faith and surrender and repentance, even we can't secure it. Jesus has secured it for us. But once we join with Christ, Christ begins to remake us into who we were made to be. And this is actually quite clear in the New Testament about the essential or in the Old Testament about the essential component of what it would mean for God to bring in a new covenant. Jeremiah 31 says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. 
and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Ezekiel 11. And when they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. Verse 19. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. And I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. Finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. So listen now, he's contrasting the old and the new covenant. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, that is the Jews. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the Old Testament law, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, and to this, to, to this day, by the way, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And listen, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, all that sounds a lot of kind of complex, and it really is. But it's amazing and it's astounding. You see, Jesus has ushered in a new covenant, but part of the glory of the new covenant is that Jesus fulfilled what we couldn't, and now as the new people of God, we are, we by grace, because we couldn't do it on our own, by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is received through faith in Christ, we are being made new. That is, the Lord who is the Spirit gives us freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. We were enslaved to our sin. We could not overcome our sin. So by new birth and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are made new. We are recreated. We are given a new heart by God that does what? That actually can love God. That actually can obey God. That actually can serve God. That's what it means to be part of the new covenant of the people of God because we're not like the old covenant anymore. We are a new people because we belong to a new humanity, a new hum, uh, uh, the new head of humanity, Jesus Christ, who has come to create a new people. And so when we become in Christ, we receive a new heart. We are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Christians are to be a different people. Not because they're a bunch of rule keepers who follow all the rules, but because they've literally been had a heart transplant by the power of the Spirit of God. And if that's never happened to you, I pray this morning you'll look to Christ. Because that's the only thing that can save you. Not more rule keeping, not more church attendance, not more getting wet in the baptism, but receiving a new heart from God by faith in Jesus Christ. A man named John once wrote this little poem. It's it's magnificent. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. That's the new covenant. That's the new covenant. God calls you to do more than you could ever do on your own, and he gives you the power to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the new covenant. Number one is new hearts. Number two, the new covenant is a new people. It's a new people. Since because the new covenant people are those who have been made new through new birth by the power of the Holy Spirit and faith in Jesus Christ, by virtue of that, they are a new people. That is... That in the Old Covenant, to be one of God's people, you had to be a Jew. If you wanted the blessings of God in the Old Covenant, and you weren't a Jew, the only way to do it is to convert. And to, if you were a male, be circumcised. And to keep the law. 
and to become a Jew, to, to be part of the old covenant. You had to be a descendant of Abraham. But you see, the new covenant, as we've already said, is different. Since it is by faith and the Spirit, and not by physical descent and law-keeping, then the new covenant people of God are not, are not just Jews, but everyone and anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Regardless of the color of your skin, or where you're from, or the language that you speak, or your socioeconomic class or background, regardless of who you are, not just the Jew, but anyone and everyone who experiences new birth by the power of the Holy Spirit and faith in Jesus Christ is now part of the new people, the new covenant people of God. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, this is Jesus, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Listen, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It doesn't matter who you were born to. It doesn't matter what family you were born in. It doesn't matter the circumstances of your birth. To be part of God's new family, you have to be born by God. Have you been born by God? That's how you become a child of God, being born of him. Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes this. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then... The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under our guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. Do you see? This, again, as we talked about last week, it's astounding. If we, if we just think about how astounding it is that a non-Jew could be saved. That's, they could not get over that. Because the whole old covenant was given to the one nation of the Jews. They couldn't get up. But that's why the, a new covenant had come. And Paul has the audacity to say that if you belong to Jesus Christ, then guess what? You are a child of Abraham. Whether you have his blood or not. Why? Because Jesus is the seed. He is the faithful one. He's the promised one that God promised Abraham. In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so if you belong to Jesus, you do belong to Abraham. And you receive all the promises of God. So the people of God are a new people, not by blood, not by descent, but by the Spirit and by faith in Christ. And this is astounding. It's just absolutely astounding. If you have ever been or ever get a chance to go overseas and just meet people who look nothing like you, who you have literally nothing in common with. You can't even talk with them because they don't speak your language. But if they know Jesus and you know Jesus, you just can't describe it. You know that you're brothers and sisters. You just know it. You can feel it in your stomach that I don't know this person, they don't know me, but we're going to live forever together. You become one family in Jesus Christ. So in the new covenant, we have new hearts. Number two, it's a new people. Number three, it's a new way of living. You see, the new covenant is better than the old, and it introduces a new way for us to live. You see, in some ways, you know, people think, you know, the old covenant, the law, the Old Testament law was so strict, and it was. But in some ways, did you know that the new covenant is actually stricter than the old covenant? Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. 
But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, why would Jesus up the ante in the new covenant? You see, it's one thing to commit adultery, but it's another thing to have lust in your heart. But we know intuitively that one leads to the other. And what Jesus is saying, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense with what we're talking about concerning the new covenant. Because the new covenant is not merely about your external actions. Since the new covenant, a new covenant person is someone who has received a new heart by faith in Jesus Christ, then the new covenant ethic is not merely that you don't do bad things, but that you don't want to do bad things. The new covenant ethic is... A person in a straight jacket can be a good person. If the only condition of being a good person is not doing bad things. That's not the new covenant. The new covenant is you've been changed. It's a, Jesus said it's not enough not to have adultery. Do not lust in your heart. Why? Because it's your heart that matters the most. It's the condition of your heart that matters. That makes, that's why in Matthew 5, 8, Jesus says... Blessed are thee, pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to see God? Then you can go to church all you want. You can get dunked all you want. None of the things are bad things, but it doesn't mean you have a pure heart. You want to see God? You got to have a pure heart. A heart that loves God. A heart that wants to be a person of integrity. A heart that wants to do right, even when no one else will know and no one else will see. A heart that loves and fears God. So a new covenant means a new way of living. And it does, in fact, mean that we're not bound by all the Jewish and ceremonial and cleanliness laws. You see, some people confuse this. They don't understand their Bible, and they think Christians are hypocrites because they think we're supposed to keep the Jewish law. But if you, get, if you read the New Testament carefully, it's actually remarkably clear. Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the Old Covenant. He, did, he succeeded where Israel failed, and in fulfilling it, he has put it aside and ushered in something new. Salvation by grace through faith in him. It says this in Ephesians 2. It says, Jesus abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Why? So that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, Jew, Gentile, together as one people of God. Through faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 2, Paul says, No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit not by the letter his praise is not from man but from God you see that to be a Jew you see the Jews thought if I'm circumcised I'm good I'm part of the covenant I'm part of the covenant of God but Paul a Pharisee a highly educated Jew said no you're wrong Circumcision is not just outward, real circumcision. In fact, the only circumcision that matters is inward. Circumcision of the heart. By what? By the Spirit. Not by the letter. Your praise is not from man, but from God. Has your heart been changed by the Spirit? That's what matters. The new covenant child of God lives a different way. The new, the new covenant child of God, the Christian, does not keep rules so that God will love him. That's not how Christianity works. We do not keep rules so that God will love us. If we belong to God, through, if we are in Jesus Christ, God loves you. And a Christian then is someone who knows so who knows so deeply that their daddy loves them that they will do anything to make daddy proud that's a new covenant child of god it's not about rules it's not about rule keeping it's about belonging to jesus christ and let me tell you something if you belong to god's beloved son jesus christ then there's no way god can't love you 
because God loves his son. And in him, we are his children as well. The Christian lives by, not by rules, but by the spirit. Because we have a new heart that wants to love and obey God from the heart. So the new covenant brings in a new heart, new people. Number three, new way of living. And number four, the new covenant has a new mediator. A new mediator. Hebrews chapter 8. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest... One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord has set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, that is Jesus, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Then Hebrews 18, 13 says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is being ready to vanish away. With the new covenant, we have a new mediator. Now, what what is all that about? Well, he's saying that Jesus... Is, a new, is our new high priest. Jesus is a new mediator between God and man. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ, Jesus. Now, what's he talking? If Jesus is our high priest, what does that mean? It means things have fundamentally changed, right? So, so remember, in the old covenant law, only certain people could be priests. Who could be priests? The descendants of Aaron, Right? You had to be a descendant of Aaron to be a priest of what? Of the tribe of Levi. But Jesus was what? He was of the tribe of Judah. Jesus couldn't be a priest. But now the author of Hebrews says he is a priest. What does it mean? It means the old is being done away with. The old is no longer enforced. A new covenant has come in which the priest is not from the tribe of Levi, but he's from the tribe of Judah. The tribe of what? The tribe of the kings. Jesus is the king and a priest. He's the ruler and our mediator before God. You see, Moses is the one who mediated the old covenant. Moses is the one who went up on the mountain and received the words from God and brought it down back to the people at Mount Sinai. And remember, the, 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 the stone was still vibrating from the etching of God's finger, writing the words of the covenant on the tablets of stone when Moses went down and saw that they had made an idol and were worshiping it, the golden calf. And at that moment, God, Moses goes back to God and God says, let me destroy this people and I will make of you a great nation. And what did Moses do? Remember? He falls down and says, God, have mercy on these people. Because if you kill them now, Egypt will say that you brought them out just to kill them. For your sake, for the sake of your name, God, have mercy on these people. What did Moses do? He mediated between God and man. But you see, Moses, he was a good mediator, but he wasn't the one we needed. Why? Because he had his own sin. And he died, and he doesn't live to mediate for us to this day. But Jesus Christ, on the other hand, is different. Jesus Christ never sinned, and yet he died for the sins of others. But because he himself had never sinned, death could not hold him. 
Death could not contain him. Therefore, he burst forth from the grave on the third day, risen from the dead, never to die again. Therefore, he has an indestructible life. And therefore, Jesus Christ lives forever to sit at the right hand of God, looking down from heaven at us and saying, God, have mercy on Chad. God, have mercy on them. God, have mercy on Cottondale Baptist Church. He lives forever to intercede for us. So that with him as our mediator, we can never be forsaken. Because he lives forever. He is ever there to present his perfect once for all sacrifice before God and say, see my father, their sins are forgiven. Their sins are atoned for. That's what it says in Hebrews 7. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. You see that? That's the, that, 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 those two words make all the difference. We can draw near to God not because of ourselves, but through him. We can come near to God. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heaven. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For since he did this once for all. When he offered up himself for the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. You see, with a new covenant, we have a new mediator, a man who has risen from the dead, a man who guarantees us with the deposit of the Holy Spirit that as he is, One day we shall be. That's the new covenant. That's the new covenant. In the new covenant, we receive new hearts. There has been created a new people, a new way of living through a new mediator. So I close this morning with just a simple question. Have you drawn near to God through Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Have you been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit? I'm talking really changed, really repented of your sin. Really believe in him, that he is the king, that he is the son of God, that he has risen from the dead, that he is coming back. Have you really believed in him, turned from your sins, trusted in him? If not, you have the opportunity this morning to respond to him. We're going to sing a song of decision in just a moment. You have the opportunity to respond. Walking down an aisle doesn't save you, but it is a way to say, Jesus Christ has saved me and I'm not ashamed and I want to come to him. So I invite you to come and respond to Jesus Christ. The altar is open. However God has spoken to you, I invite you to respond. Father, thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for the blood that was poured out, which was the